joy of the Lord is my strength. Lord, we look to you this morning. Lord, I, I, I pray, Father, as I, as, I, as I bring this, Lord, that you would speak, Father. We want to hear from you this morning. Father. We have been hearing from you this morning. You've been speaking to us since we got it. And I pray, Father, that we would hear something, something special from you, Father, this morning. Every, every, every one of us, Lord, would know that we've been in the presence of the living Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, sorry, it's me again. Um, it was because I swapped from earlier in the month. Um, yeah, and last time I started talking about justice, and th- this idea that um, there's this. I told the story of this town um, where there's people out having a, a picnic or coffee by the river and they see these bodies coming down the river and they, they go out and they fish the people out of the river and, and they look after them and they have compassion for them and they show great generosity towards these people and they, uh, but then they decide that they're going to go up river and find the source of the problem um, and they said that God's mission to bring salvation to the human race is a little bit like that a little bit like that, he's, he's on a mission to um, bring salvation to break the power of sin and death that has broken this world um, and to reverse some of that damage and I want to uh, uh, over the next months really it's going to take a while to do this um, look at some of the detail on how that works um, so I'll start off with that from Psalm 89. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. So I'm going to uh, read from the second half of Genesis 18. I'm going to be in the NIV. Um, But let's first remind ourselves of what happened in the first half of Genesis 18. 18. So, um, Abraham and Sarah were at home um, near the great trees of Mamre, where they, uh, the Lord turned up with two angels. He's in human form. Um, but Abraham knew immediately who it was. God, quite often in the Old Testament, uh, appears um, in the form of the angel of the Lord. And, and sometimes he appeared to Daniel, and, he, and he's, he, he's magnificent, he's splendid, and, and, and he's he, he come from heaven. He appeared to Joshua, and he's uh, a soldier. He's the commander of the armies of heaven. But he's not appearing like that here. He, he, there are three men, it says, who turn up um, where Abraham and Sarah are at home. Um, and Abraham recognises the Lord. Why did Abraham recognise the Lord? Because he just looks like a bloke. Because he's his friend. The Lord had been speaking to Abraham, and Abraham knew him. He recognised his voice, and he recognised his presence. And they ate together. I love this. God and two angels turn up for lunch. Unannounced. And they sit, and it's great detail of this meal, how they have to go and prepare the bread and prepare the meat, and these people are waiting. I don't know what they're talking about in the meantime, uh, while, all, while all this happens. Um, and as they ate, one of the angels, it seems, um, asked him where Sarah was. And, and he says in, in verse 10, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Sarah was still inside the tent at this time, and she heard this and laughed, because they were both very old, it says. But the Lord challenged her. He said, is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. So he's reiterating a promise that he's made before. And Sarah laughed. I'm going to pick the story up at verse 16. Genesis 18, verse 16. 
When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I suppose we got the words, couldn't we? All the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. Verse 19. For I've chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they've done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not, not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than fifty? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? Go find forty-five there, he said. I will not destroy it. Once again he spoke to him. What if only forty are found there? And he said, for the sake of 40, I will not destroy it. And then he said, Abraham said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 people were found there? He said, I will not do it till I find 30 there. And Abraham said, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. And then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only ten can be found there? He said, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham. He left and Abraham returned home. That must be one of the most astonishing conversations anywhere. Abraham gets in God's face and challenges him. That's incredible. Verse 17, the Lord says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I've chosen him. He will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. So if Abraham is going to be a great leader, he must be able to make good judgments. In fact, he needs to model them. He is the man that many people in future generations will look back to as the father of faith. God says in um, verse 19, I've chosen him that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So God is kind of training Abraham. Training him in justice. And here he's including him in his judgment over Sodom and Gomorrah. This is amazing. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I'm going to do? In Abraham's day, there was no written law as such. Much later, the people of Israel would be given a legal code in the law of Moses. And, and later still, after Pentecost, 
He gives us the Holy Spirit to work inside us, as the, as the prophet Jeremiah promised. Um, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. We have the Holy Spirit living in us, dwelling among us. What an amazing privilege that is. But in Abraham's time, there was no law, no code to look to. There's no extrinsic criteria for judgment, really. You couldn't get to tablets of stone or some scroll somewhere and say it is written, because it wasn't. It's a question of, of natural justice. We might well be asking, well, how were they supposed to know? How were they supposed to know? By what criteria is God judging Sodom and Gomorrah? And how is Abraham supposed to be part of this? It's a serious question. Let's have a look. There's a well-known verse in, in Micah that we had quite recently, I think. Did we have it last week? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. What does the law require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the law require of you but to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? So, okay, that's a simple enough statement. He has shown us what is good. God has shown us what is good. And, and, and that includes, he, 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 he includes some things in his verse, some indicators. Loving mercy is one of the things that he's shown us. And walking humbly. Walking humbly. Acknowledging God as our saviour, understanding. I think it's A.W. Tozer said something like, um, it's the natural process for moral beings to worship. He sees worship as the natural outcome of moral beings. It's something that we naturally do. Because why? Because we're created and we have a creator and we naturally look to him as the source of our life. We do if we're conscious of who we are and how we got here and our place in the world. So we naturally worship. This is what we should do. And this affects our behaviour. Act justly. Do justly, the old one says. And what else do we know? That's one thing we know. He said, he's shown you what is good. What does the law require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? But what else do we know? Well, when God finished creating everything, and mankind, in his own image, he says, Genesis 1, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. God made everything good, and showed us. He showed us what is good. And what is made is good. The people God had made chose the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. With disobedience came the knowledge of evil. In the presence of God there is only good. Fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore, one of the Psalms says. Outside there are tough choices. We have a moral, we're placed in a, in a, in a moral conundrum. As soon as we step outside the presence of God, our Decisions have consequences. This is why we have to act justly, love mercy and walk humbly with our God so that we make the right decisions. So people are either looking to God to get their moral code or away from him. And this applies to the people in Sodom as much as it does to anyone else. They are perfectly free to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with their God. They can do that. They're free to do that. 
If they want, they can do that. But there's a problem. Like the people in Genesis 6, verse 5, every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts is only evil all the time. They are free to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with their God, but they're choosing not to do that. They're doing something else instead. It can sometimes seem to us as if God's justice and righteousness are far away and inaccessible. There's something that we can aspire to from a great distance, but come nowhere near. And that God is going to come one day and, and pour out wrath on us for merely being human. But when God visited Abraham and Sarah and came for dinner and left them with a promise of a blessing, I will come this time next year and you will have a baby. She laughed at him. She laughed at him. <laughs> Not that again. Not that again. Heard that before. 90 years old. In spite of her doubt, her cynicism, God didn't condemn her. In fact, he promised her a blessing. Okay, try and get your head around that. So his visit to, to Abraham and Sarah on the hill is a good, it, it, it's, come, it's come for lunch, it's come to share fellowship and to leave a blessing. His visit to Sodom and Gomorrah is of a different sort, but it's justified. God relates to people. He made us for fellowship with himself. So he isn't asking us to jump through impossible hoops. We are made in the image of God. It is the natural thing for us to worship him. It sometimes looks impossible from where we stand because our world looks a lot like Sodom and Gomorrah. And our expectations are quite low. But he expects better of us. And he'll take us on that journey. Abraham believed God's promise. When three men turned up at his home, he recognised God. Why did he recognise God? Because they were friends. God had spoken to him, promised him things. Abraham was a friend of God. Sarah didn't believe yet, but she would do. She would believe too. The promise would be fulfilled and Sarah would believe and she'd be full of joy. They called their son Isaac laughter and it's a joyful laughter. It's a bubbling over laughter. It's not a single laugh. It turned her frustration and her bitterness and her cynicism into delight and joy. And she believed. She's on a journey. And God is taking her on that journey. He's teaching her as he's teaching Abraham. But Sodom and Gomorrah, different state of affairs. Entirely different state of affairs. God is going to punish these cities for their pursuit of evil. But he's not just going to throw fire at them from his heaven, rain fire on them. He's going to do two things. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to speak to Abraham about it. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I'm going to do? And then he's going to go and see for himself. He runs it past Abraham first. Okay. God's justice is for people. It's about people. It isn't arbitrary. 
God isn't going to judge these cities. Sorry, God is going to judge these cities from a human perspective. And, and, and then God, God investigates. God, God, God gets involved. <coughs> are we not? No, we're not. Where are we? Twenty twenty one, that's the one. The Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see what they if if what they've done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. Now we understand that God is all seeing, all knowing, and all present, etc. It's omnipotent, omniscient. So it's quite hard for us to understand why he needs to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah to find out what they're up to. Because doesn't he know what they're up to? I'm sure he does. And I'm sure he could just fling fire from heaven at them and destroy them. And he'd be quite just in doing that. It wouldn't be anything, it, it would be fine, in a sense, for him to do that. Because what they're doing is evil and God is just. But... No one would know why the cities were destroyed. There would be no process. God enacts justice from a human perspective. Of course, he's well aware, uh, well aware of what's going on. But he's going to show Abraham and us a due process of judgment. And he isn't going to act based on an outcry. He's going to go and find out for himself. So what outcry is this anyway? Who in Sodom is demanding justice? By the end of the chapter we establish that there are no righteous people there except for Lot. Is he the one who's crying out? It's possible that, he, that it's Lot that's crying out. But I think there's more. This looks like a digression, but bear with me because I think it's important. Revelation 6, 9 and 10. This is the fifth seal. He opened the fifth seal. And I saw under the altar the souls of those who'd been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they'd maintained. And they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. These are the, are the souls under the altar. In heaven. Who are they? These are people who throughout history have been persecuted, oppressed and murdered by those who oppose God. All the way from Abel, right in the beginning. Their outcry for justice continually comes up before God not so much their prayers. I'm sure that their prayers are, you know, to do with reconciliation and to do with righteousness and to do with holiness. Um, I'm sure that they're not, you know, calling for vengeance. But God hears that anyway because their blood cries out, just as Abel's did. God said to Cain, your, brother, your brother's blood cries out from the ground. And this is true in Sodom. Two, God hears the outcry concerning Sodom and Gomorrah and has come down with a couple of angels to investigate it. Now, if you read on in the story, into Genesis 90, you see that these two angels turn up at Sodom. And they're going to rescue Lot and his family. But they're physically attacked brutally attacked by the people there as they, as they try to extract Lot. They, they, they find out, it's a, God's coming down to find out, to investigate for himself whether it's as bad as this outcry says. And, and yes, it is as bad. It's appalling. This is God's justice in practice. And we see the same process being worked out 
in the life of Christ. This is how the gospel works. Just as the angels rescued Lot from Sodom, Jesus came to seek and to save the lot, those who were lost. Luke 19.10. Look at that. No. We know it anyway. God is not prepared to destroy these cities on the basis of an allegation. Even the outcry of the righteous, he comes to see for himself, just as he did in Christ, in the likeness of sinful flesh, as Paul puts it. God is just and righteous, and he wants Abraham and us to see that he is just and righteous. And now we come to the best bit. This talk is a bit like beans on toast. We've had the toast. Now we've come to the beans. The human beings. God is a prosecutor here. He's come to bring, to investigate this allegation and to prosecute the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham is the defence counsel. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. Verses 22, 23. So the men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? So the three visitors and the Lord, uh, the Lord and his two companions head off to Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham stands in front of the Lord and challenges him. Abraham challenges the Lord. Now remember, Abraham hasn't heard all the stuff we've just been talking about. He doesn't know what God is thinking. He just sees them heading off towards the cities. And stands in the Lord's way. He's very polite, as you would expect. But he's also very insistent. Because Abraham has a a heart for God's justice. Will he sweep away the righteous with the wicked? He's challenging God. He sees what God is about to do. And he says you can't just kill everyone. He goes on. This is 24 to be fine. Ah, okay. What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep... Sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Because mass punishments are obviously not right. They are unjust. Abraham knows this and he challenges God. And God has invited this. God is making himself publicly accountable to Abraham. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? This is inc- I find this astonishing. It's completely astonishing. But it, it kind of peels back a curtain on, on, on the character of God, the nature of of God. For ages, the righteous people in these cities have been crying out to God for justice. And now they're gone. And even in their death, the blood justifies before God. And eventually God responds. But <laughs> it's as if he's saying, I need to check this with Abraham first. Because Abraham's a righteous man. And Abraham's going to be the father of this nation. And Abraham's going to be the person that everyone looks to for righteousness. So, we're going to see what Abraham does in this situation. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I'm going to do? God takes Abraham seriously as a voice of justice. After all, his plan for salvation, his rescue mission, depends upon Abraham. And Abraham is confident to stand before God and challenge him. Because Abraham knows God and knows his love and faithfulness. God is demonstrating his faithfulness to Abraham 
He's given him promises and he's delivering on those promises. And he comes back year after year and he reiterates his promises. He's just been with them, having a meal with them, sharing a meal with Abraham and talking about the family. God answers Abraham. If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And Abraham isn't finished. He whittles God down. 45, 40, 30, right down to 10. In the end, he says, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak this once more. What if only 10 are found there? He says, Oh, for the sake of 10, I won't destroy it. Abraham had finished, um, when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. What did we get from this? God is not remote from us. He wants us to know him, not in a religious sense, but in a personal sense. He wants us to have the same kind of close relationship with him that he can turn up for dinner and talk about the family. How, how good is that? <laughs> He's among us. God is just. God's the creator of the universe and will carry out judgment against wickedness. We can have no doubt about that. No one gets away with anything. He hears the long cry of his people. Their prayers and their tears rise before him. Their blood indeed Ours too, he, and he answers. He judges on the basis of truth that he personally establishes by being among us, and he comes to find out for himself. Abraham is bold to challenge God. We know that Abraham was flaky. Twice he passed his wife off as his sister because he was afraid. That is not a sign of great nobility or righteousness. But he did it. Then he did it, he did it again. We might look at Abraham and think, really? But God is holding himself accountable to Abraham in a matter of his righteousness. How amazing is that? His righteousness is based on faith. Oops. Where are we? Oh, I don't know. There's some doubt this one. Romans 4.3. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So what do we take away from this? Right. We need to uh, have some takeaways. Abraham challenged God. He saw what looked like an injustice. Abraham saw what looked like an injustice from God and didn't let it slip past. God engineered this situation. God has set Abraham up so that Abraham would stand in his face and challenge him so that his process of justice can be seen. It's not arbitrary. He's not going to just fling fire at people he doesn't like. He's going to investigate. He's going to find out. 2 Peter 2, 6-9. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made an example of what is going to... and made them an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued a lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man lived among them day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the, right and the, hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. The Lord will judge the ungodly. Those who reject him are condemned. The scripture says this over and over and over. There is no getting away from that. But God's judgment is righteous. And it is seen to be righteous. 
he makes a point of making it transparent. It's common these days to think of God's justice as being wholly restorative. A lot of people will talk about this, and, and it is true. We like to think that he doesn't punish as such, but he comes to redeem and save. And of course, this, this is true. And we will look at that. We love to think about these things. But there can be no doubt that God punishes those who reject him, especially those who've stood in opposition to him, who've persecuted, oppressed and murdered his people. This, this is not the arbitrary wrath of some remote dictator. God judges righteously. And he brings Abraham into his council. So, a few things. Abraham believed God. And that was his righteousness. Do you believe him? Do you believe him? Sarah didn't. He came along with a promise and she laughed at him. But she did believe him. She came to believe him. She, she was being trained, being taught. She came to believe him. But there was a time when she didn't. Don't pretend. Abraham respectfully challenged something he thought was wrong and spoke in defence of these cities. He defended the indefensible, really. What things do we need to challenge? What are the things that we need to challenge? God challenged, Abraham challenged God. Maybe I need to challenge myself. Finally, Micah 6, 8. He's shown you a man what is good. And what does the law require of you but to act justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. I'm going to sing, I think. There we go.